صراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين السلام عليكم everybody wanted to welcome you to our webinar on building endowments my name is Mohi Khwaja from the American Muslim Fund and today we have with us um, uh, the Sana Trust Foundation and Wahid Invest and I'm going to uh, allow everybody to introduce themselves uh, so as we get started um, I'd like to welcome Ataka Sayeda Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is Atika Sayyid. I'm, I'm the co-founder um, of Sanatris Foundation, and I'm currently serving as the financial and development director of Sanatris Foundation. Um, I can actually speak, say a little bit more about myself. So um, I graduated from John Molson School of Business from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, with a degree in finance. Um, I also ha have a certificate from the Islamic Teacher Education Program, uh, which is an affiliate of University of Toronto. I also have spent about four years um, studying as an Alamo student, studying Quran, Arabic language, uh, the prophetic life and character, science of um, Hadith and Islamic jurisprudence. I am also currently pursuing a nonprofit management cert certificate um, with the Harvard University Extension School. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Saad, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. And thank you again uh, to, to Buhi and Sana Trust as well. And for everyone who's attending this webinar, I want to very quickly before I introduce myself, you guys have seen the chat section there. So feel free to ask any questions as we all go through the webinar. And inshallah, towards the end, your questions will get addressed. So my name is Saad Zarif. I'm actually the Vice President of North America at Wahid Invest, which if you are not familiar with, is the first ever Sharia compliant uh, robo investment platform in the United States. Uh, we are also a global platform. Uh, we have our services available in the UK, recently in Malaysia as well, and inshallah soon in the Middle East and Canada also. Uh, I come from an accounting background. I did my degree in accounting back home in London, then worked in private equity venture capital space for a couple of years, and moved to America in 2007. Um, got a job in New York, working as a trader on Wall Street. And for those of you who may remember the 2009 market crash, um, I was there to experience it firsthand. Um, working in the trenches on Wall Street. So that sort of taught me a bit about how investments are done and what should not be done with them. As time progressed, I did some money management work at Morgan Stanley and a few other firms, and fortunately had the pleasure of learning and understanding about the space of Sharia-compliant investments. Uh, fast forward, uh, for the last six years, I've been strictly working uh, within the Sharia-compliant investment space, working with Muslims, uh, helping them understand investments, and now building a relationship with both Mui from American Muslim Fund as well as uh, Son of Trust that I will discuss a little bit uh, later. I joined Wahid about two and a half years ago, and Alhamdulillah, we've been doing some tremendous work. Fantastic. Thank you, Saad. Rehan, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Assalamu As alaikum, inshallah. I'm uh, honored to be here as well. And uh, I would just want to clarify that um, Saad was in New York. Uh, and experience the banking crisis. He did not have any part in causing it at all. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, he's actually on, the, on, he's on, he's yes. on our side. Thank he's you for the disclaimer there. there. I I'm appreciate it. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Uh, and, and, and we're honored to be actually working with Saad and Wahed and Mohi as well on, 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 on the work that we're doing behind the scenes, but then also as part of this webinar. Again, uh, as Mohi said, my name is Rehan Mirza. I'm the founding executive director of Senate Trust Foundation. Uh, I graduated from uh, Columbia University's Teacher College with a master's degree in social organizational psychology. Alhamdulillah, while in New York, I had the opportunity to um, do some internships with the United Nations there in New York and then Alhamdulillah in Geneva. And uh, subsequent to my studies in New York, was able to travel to um, a small city called Tarim in Hadramaut Valley of, uh, of Yemen and benefit from the company of the scholars and the students uh, while there. And uh, upon my return, I began a uh, doctoral uh, program in neuropsychology, but um, decided to take an uh, leave of, indefinite leave of absence to pursue um, the vision and the dream that we had with Senate Trust Foundation. Alhamdulillah, I've been honored to be a part of that project for the past nine years and um, hope to share more, inshallah, in a few minutes regarding our project and our relationship with uh, AMF and, and Wahid as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and. 
again, my name is Muhi Khwaja. I have been working in nonprofit fundraising for the last 10 years and uh, right out of undergrad, didn't really know what I wanted to do with a history and psychology degree, but fortunately fell into the an opportunity at the University of Michigan, uh, learning how the university fundraised from their alumni, from their sports teams, uh, and the <laughs> medical university uh, and everything in between. So really got a firsthand experience seeing how 500 fundraisers would fundraise for a university uh, and was fortunate to take that experience on to the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, ISPU, uh, was their first development hire focusing on fundraising best practices, building strategy across the country of how they should fundraise, uh, working on monthly donations, uh, doing everything around events that our community knows so well. <laughs> Uh, and how to become more efficient in that uh, was uh, went back to the University of Michigan for my master's in nonprofit management and public administration. And after graduating, was also consulting with organizations like Islamic Relief, Islamic Scholarship Fund, Islamic Society of North America, to name a few. Uh, and then moved to California to work with organizations like Tight Leaf Collective and also did some consulting with Indian Muslim Relief and Charities. Uh, but for the last five years, I'd been at the American Red Cross, uh, working with families and individuals and their charitable giving. Uh, and in that time period, when I went to the Red Cross, I really still wanted to be actively involved with the Muslim community. And I didn't want to recreate the wheel, but I looked at the community and saw what gaps there were and identify this space of community foundations. Um, so I'll jump into the uh, rest of the PowerPoint and we'll talk a little bit about American Muslim Fund and why we started. Um, so here's some brief data on the American Muslim ethnic breakdown. There's some studies done by ISPU, by CARE, by Muslim Advocates and MPAC, uh, Muslim Public Affairs Council, uh, and even Pew Research uh, that break down the ethnic community in the Muslim uh, space in the United States. So, uh, you know, we're many minorities combined to become uh, about 3.3 million uh, individuals. And that's a low estimate, of course. Um, and, you know, if uh, my, you know, people like my parents who came in the 1970s all the way to immigrants today uh, from coming from India, uh, many people from the Middle East and the longstanding African-American community and also immigrant community from Africa uh, and the newly um, members who have converted to Islam, many of whom are of Latino and Hispanic background. Um, and this 9% other category, you have a mix of Caucasian and other um, multi-ethnicities as well. Uh, and from that 3.3 million Muslims estimated, uh, there are at least 1.5 million registered Muslim voters. Uh, so you're seeing an increase of activism in uh, civic engagement. Uh, you know, in 2020, we have the upcoming census, so I'm sure we'll see more of that uh, ethnic participation as well in hard to count communities. Uh, but the American Muslim landscape of nonprofit organizations has really been um, from uh, seeing the Muslim communities and schools uh, develop and masjids develop uh, all the way to now social service organizations, uh, educational institutions, and uh, what I would say like the 2.0 and 3.0 of the Muslim American community genesis uh, of providing these types of social services. Uh, so there are over 2,000 mosques across the country. Uh, there are at least 7,500 nonprofit organizations registered as Islamic, according to the IRS. Uh, and there are over 300 Muslim schools with over 40,000 students. Um, so these could be part-time Sunday schools all the way to full-time schools as well. Uh, and the thing to note is in the United States, there's over 1 million nonprofit organizations. Um, and many things are the same. There are a majority of people... Uh, a majority of the nonprofit organizations have a budget of less than $250,000. Uh, they also have a staffing of less than two full-time staff. So the Muslim community is no different when it comes to the nonprofit landscape. However, there are a lot of best practices that we could be implementing in the Muslim community, especially when it comes to fundraising uh, and specifically endowments as well. Endowments and wakfs are 
in line with the history of uh, Islam as well. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Rehan and uh, the Son of Trust team will go into that a little bit. So I wanted to preface all of this by saying that, you know, the American Muslim community is also one that is actively uh, involved in the um, economic uplifting of the society as well. Um, so I don't know if the screen is advancing, um, but there's at least an annual income, disposable income of $124 trillion, uh, sorry, uh, million dollars um, annually. Uh, and that Muslims are also the second largest non-Christian population in over 20 states across the country. So, you know, who would have guessed that in Kentucky or in Wyoming and some of these other states across the country that Muslims are the uh, second largest religious group as well. So that being said, uh, when it comes to uh, nonprofit organizations and, and donors to those nonprofit organizations, um, we know that Giving USA has done a report in association with Indiana University, and they track the amount that Americans give annually. Uh, in 2017, Americans gave $410 billion, and in 2018, uh, Americans have given $427 billion. So there's a lot of information on this slide, and what I wanted to highlight is that religion and education are the top two. Uh, for the last several years uh, that um, where charitable dollars go. So a good 29% goes to religious causes and a good 14% go to education. So, you know, I think that a lot of times in the Muslim community and even in the nonprofit fundraising community, we think of a scarcity when it comes to resources. But I would actually say the opposite, that there's an abundance and the, the wealth is there, right? It's a matter of how we build the relationships with the nonprofit organizations that um, we fundraise and donate to. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of information here. What I will say is that individuals give a lion's share of the um, giving. Uh, so, you know, giving by bequest means planned giving, which is like leaving an estate or setting up a trust. Uh, and giving by foundations, a lot of those are individuals. Uh, some, uh, and then giving by corporations is only 5%. So you can estimate that at least 90 to 95% is giving from individuals. Uh, so when we often look at our nonprofit organizations and the strategy around it, we say, oh, it'd be great if there was a foundation who could underwrite this, right? But the idea being that if we focus on expanding our uh, individual giving and we do more to build that relationship with those individuals who are supporting our nonprofits and really make it more relational than transactional, we'll see an increase in commitments and giving to our nonprofit organizations. Um, so there are over 700 community foundations across the country. Uh, and the American Muslim Fund started in 2016 because as I was actively involved at the Red Cross, I still wanted to be involved in the Muslim community. And I saw this gap where there were no community foundations across the country focusing on Muslim philanthropy. Uh, and there are giving circles and there are family foundations that represent Muslim philanthropy, but there was no overall um, vehicle for Muslim philanthropy to kind of advance through uh, what we'll talk about, about donor advice funds and giving circles uh, in a more um, strategic way. So when we started in 2016, we kind of recruited board members. We went through a, a minimum viable product uh, design work. We uh, built a strategic plan and all of this to focus on our nonprofit organization. What do we want to accomplish? How did we want to support nonprofit organizations? How do we want to support donors in their charitable giving and provide solutions? Um, so we developed this idea of creating donor advice funds. And I'm going to get into that in the next few slides as well. Uh, so we really focus on a few main things. And 
you know, inshallah, this year we're uh, we're wrapping up 2019 and we're in route to kind of scale our organization and provide more services to the nonprofits and to the donors as well. So, what are those core services? Uh, we focus on donor advised funds, which are a giving vehicle for families or businesses to distribute all of their charitable giving through. They go through one point of entry and they would give the funds to American Muslim Fund. We would provide them with the tax deduction up front. And then afterwards, they can decide over the rest of their life where to distribute those funds to. So, um, you know, I'll let uh, Saad talk about like the um, ways in which you can donate stock and the ways in which you can uh, distribute appreciated assets and be more creative about that. Um, the other service that we provide is through uh, giving circles, and we uh, allow groups of family friends or um, families or friends to give together to support a common cause and come together on um, doing all of their charitable giving through a means like a community foundation. And, you know, you may be asking, like, why don't people just give directly to the causes? And um, when you're giving through a community foundation, what you're doing is you're relying on the community foundation to do research and due diligence and vetting of the nonprofit organizations. Uh, you're also allowing the, um, the families who participate to streamline their giving. Uh, and when you give through a donor advised fund, you can actually invest the balance. You can name it after your family. Uh, and there are a lot of benefits involved with uh, having a donor advised fund or seeing the impact of collective philanthropy through a giving circle. Um, and uh, the reason why we're talking today is about focusing on endowments and how nonprofit organizations uh, can set them up. So um, as a community foundation, that is one of the services that we provide is uh, allowing nonprofit institutions to set up endowments with American Muslim Fund and partnering with um, financial institutions such as Wahid and others uh, to really focus on the investment growth and aspect of uh, future growth in regards to uh, nonprofit sustainability. So donor advice funds, why do donors create them? Uh, they create them for convenience, for increased giving potential, uh, for the flexibility, like 2019 is coming to a close, but if your financial advisor says you should actually donate more in 2019 to lower your uh, tax income bracket, right? If that's the scenario that you're in, you can put those funds into a donor advised fund, but then decide which nonprofits to give them to later. Uh, and a donor advised fund allows the flexibility to accept more complex assets that you may own, whether it's real estate or appreciated stock or um, other means as well. So you get to contribute to your donor advised fund. You get the automatic deduction the moment you make those gifts. You can distribute them later on in life. You can invest them in mutual funds or Sharia compliant stocks and everything like that. And then you can recommend an issue, you can collect LOIs, uh, letters of interest, or requests for proposals from nonprofit organizations and do this in a more organized fashion. Um, and alhamdulillah, we have some families that, um, you know, have, uh, the collective impact that we've seen now is over the last three years, we've been able to, at the end of this month, distribute $1.3 million. And that's simply with working with 55 families. So especially, you know, imagine if we had 500, 5,000, 500,000 Muslim families participating in a community foundation, the impact would be astronomical. So we're looking at ways in which we can be more strategic with our charitable giving and provide those solutions. Uh, and now I will pass it over to Saad to uh, take it away on investing. Yeah, thank you very much, Mohi. That was, uh, you know, very good learning curve uh, in many ways. Um, so I'm going to start with asking one thing. I always tell people to ask themselves, why is money important to you? More often than less, you will answer questions like, well, it allows me to buy whatever you want. Um, it allows me to be mentally comfortable that I have money saved. Or it gives me what, in our financial terms or economics, we use purchasing power, buy whatever you want. But also it allows you to give. 
it allows you to make a difference. Um, and how? Well, exactly how Mohi covered, whether you want to open a donor advice fund through them. And then how does endowments work really in a nutshell? Like what happens to that money? Where is it invested? That is where people like myself and our company come, comes into play. The whole purpose of setting up an endowment is to support a course. In our case right now, Sunnet Trust Foundation. And the one thing I'll say that personally, I do have a goal in helping them, inshallah, reach at least $250,000 in the endowment by end of Q1 of next year. So feel free to share the recordings. Hopefully that works out well for this webinar with people. Learn about it. Go and look at, uh, uh, you know, American Muslim Fund's website as well to see how you can take advantage of that. So now, the part about investment. What, is, what does the money get invested in for that endowment to grow? Well, we did touch base on the idea of halal stocks. How does that come about? We specialize in this space. In fact, a few months ago, we were the first and only Sharia-compliant investment firm to ring the opening bell at NASDAQ because we launched our own exchange-traded fund. It has about 200 stocks in it. Uh, some of them are well-known companies like Apple, Intel, even Salesforce, and so on. So reputable companies. Um, and the purpose of that particular investment vehicle is for it to allow growth over time. Uh, yes, there's volatility in the market that cannot be ignored, but this is how you make things work by offering a diversified portfolio. If you can look to the screen on the left that I say diversified, where there are different options of investments that we put together in a pool. So when your donations come in to what Mohi had said earlier, that it gets invested and grows, this is how it grows by putting those investments together. The right of the image I find quite powerful because you could be living your day to day life doing what you love to do, but still being an investor whether it's for yourself or for an organization of your choosing. When it comes to endowments or charitable givings, there are two questions you should ask yourself. What is it, what's in it for me in the current life and the afterlife? Well, Satkai Jariya for one, if we're answering ourselves backwards, that after I pass away, I know there'll be some barka and so on that will keep on running for me. But in reality now, while I'm alive and I'm making these donations, think taxes you get tax benefits from it and that is the reality of things in here and that's what i'm going to touch base now on on my second slide actually since i've touched base on our etf which is halal hlal there's the ticker symbol that we use in our investments here but more importantly about understanding <laughs> what are the other ways you can give money to a non-profit organization especially if you're not going through the regular route of hey just using a credit card or check i want to make a bigger impact either through a daf or on my own well, donating through your IRA, your individual retirement account is a smart way. If you are or you know someone who's reached the age of 70 and a half, by law, and by law I mean the IRS says, that you need to stop taking money out of your retirement account. And if you have appreciated stocks in it, regardless of what you have in it, every time you take money out, you have to pay taxes on it. The way you benefit from getting a tax break is by donating those appreciated stocks to a charity of your choosing. With Sunnet Trust Foundation, we've established uh, an endowment account, actually, through interactive brokers. And you can always reach out to them to get that account number through which you can make those donations. And this is the power of doing something good that actually pays you off now as well. If someone who will have like $100,000 in an IRA and you reach the age of 70 and a half, for example, and you make what's called a qualified charity donation, so to speak, a QCD, that amount will completely be tax-free for you. And I would highly recommend, speak to a tax specialist about this, that, hey, I have some appreciated stocks, I have an IRA, uh, my dad is turned 70 and a half, and he may want to make some donation from this uh, to a charity of his uh, choosing, or my mother would like to, whatever. How would that work out for me? It's a very easy and seamless process, but there's, a, there's an act called Protecting Americans from Tax Hikes Act of 2015, and this is the pure purpose of that. They use your... IRA money, the money that has grown over time in order for it to work for you. Um, and any charity or nonprofit organization that has an investment account, you are very much easily able to do that and make those donations. Moving on to the next slide. Now that so I'm real quick this. before we do that, one thing that I'll say is the reason why um, this QCD is super important is, you know, a family may not you know, a family may be able to set up a legacy of their giving, a sadaqajariya, an endowment, or a waqf, or a donor advice fund with this $100,000, right? But then from there, they can distribute to so many different charities. Uh, and that's the value add yes. of partnering with a donor advice fund for your qualified charitable distributions. 
Absolutely. You're choosing more than one for that support. And actually in that, I'll just add one more thing very quickly, is while we're looking at donating your appreciated stocks, think about the Jewish Communal Fund in New York. That has over $4 billion that they're able to give to charities all across New York, New Jersey, um, which includes Brooklyn. I don't know if anyone's from New York here, but they are very pro-Brooklyn, whoever they are. Um, fact is that that particular organization and the charities that they support don't need to borrow. They, they don't need to ask for donations from people. They literally push people away. Don't give us donations. Give it to someone else. We have the Jewish Communal Fund that actually supports us year round. And that is the purpose of what American Muslim Fund is doing right now through these dafts. We can create this concept where it becomes consistent for us to be supporting nonprofit organizations such as Sun Trust Foundation that are doing some amazing work and others and help them grow and flourish as well. So think of it that way. Now, I've talked about your IRAs that, hey, you can donate appreciated uh, income from that while setting up a DAF or otherwise if you're 70 and a half. You can do the same thing with your stocks as well. If you have an individual investment account somewhere and you have appreciated stocks that over many years have grown substantially in value, well, fact is, if you take that money out, you will pay capital gains tax on it. But if you donate it, no, you won't be. And again, you can uh, connect with Mui as well on this or through Senate Trust account as to how you can do that and take advantage of it. But this slide has like three different important points in it. The one that I've highlighted in blue actually speaks volumes, uh, which is more about the Prophet Wasallam, who had said that when a person dies, his works end, except for three of them, his ongoing charity, knowledge that is benefited from, and righteous child who prays for him. So we know that these things are very much achievable for us. We're in this world for a short period of time. How can we make the most of it for ourselves and for those around us, as well as supporting our communities? So these are very easy ways to really make a huge impact. One, it in reality benefits your pocket as well. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with taking tax advantages. Not, nothing wrong with pushing your taxes away from Uncle Sam because you're giving it to a charitable cause and I would highly recommend if you guys want to learn more about donor advice funds, look at the American Muslim Fund website. They have some really good content uh, over there for you to understand the benefits of setting up that account. And again, the investments in them will be some of those that we will work with uh, with Mui on uh, in terms of our Sharia compliant ETF that gives diversifications, dividend income that allows that money to grow and for it to keep supporting multiple charities um, as well. Um, and with that, the last bit that I want to cover on the next slide will be about our relationship with Summit Trust. So, um, why invest? Actually, very quickly, I'll just remind you guys, for those who may not be familiar with us, as to why this company was created. We were looking to solve a problem to a solution about the broader Muslim community in America as to how they can invest their money, knowing that it's being invested in the best way possible in a Sharia compliant platform. Junaid, the founder, actually ended up having a conversation while working in New York, took a cab. Uh, with the Muslim cab driver, and he found out that the Muslim cab driver had a certain amount of money saved up. And he said that my local imam has mentioned that Apple is a halal stock, and I'm thinking of investing all of it in that. I mean, yes, Apple is a great company, we all know that, but what is saying, God forbid, it could, be, could not be the future AOL? And that is what he thought about, that, okay, fine, if a company like AOL can come, exist, uh, and, and crash, what if that happens to Apple, why isn't this guy not diversifying his investment? He's under the impression that financial advisors charge substantial amount of money, which they do in order to provide advice. That evening, he con created the concept of why he'd invest. Reached out to me a few weeks later, and I was like, yep, this is a complete no-brainer. This is what our community needs. Fast forward two and a half years later, here we are, working with nonprofit organizations, uh, institutions such as American Muslim Fund, Sun Trust Foundation, to help grow this mindset of investment as well, that your money comes in, does the purpose it's supposed to, supports your tax benefits as well, and Zatkajari for yourself in the future, while knowing that it's being invested based on our ethical values as well. And that's why our relationship with Sun Trust comes in, that we've built an account for them uh, in which they put some money in, and we're hoping that you will all be generous in providing support as well to them as they grow for working on their cause. And that's where we come in to sort of help them through these webinars and other educational content that we can provide you to really understand the benefits of setting up a donor advice fund, the benefits of investing your money, also in ethical funds so that they resonate with your values as well. Um, I think with that, I, I do want to leave a lot for the questions and answer session as well. So I'm going to let Brother Rihan now from here take over and share more about Sunday Trust Foundation itself, their story and so on. Assalamu alaikum. 
thank you, Mohi. Thank you, Saad, and, and everyone who's joined as well. Um, it's an honor, inshallah, to go through uh, some of our work, and it's a humbling uh, responsibility as well, and I hope, inshallah, I do it justice. Um, I have basically three slides, and my intention is to go through kind of what our motivations were and our aspirations, what we are accomplishing now, and then kind of what we hope to accomplish in the future. So in the first slide, if Mohi can advance that, I'll, I'll sh there are four kind of uh, pillars, I would say, four intentions to our work. Um, and I believe that this is important to share, not to go into too much of the history and the origins, but really I think as philanthropists and as a community, we have to evaluate the origins of our institutions, ensure that they're based on the standards, both ethically and morally, but also just the organizational principles and the fiscal responsibility that our faith also expects of us as well. So having said that, I think that our, our, our foundation has basically these four building blocks. Um, the, the first picture going in clockwise uh, order is a picture of my father, late father, but I, I use him um, not only to represent what he means to me, but him as a representative of a generation of pioneers. Uh, Muslims that were living in these lands prior to the arrival of our parents' generation and then our parents' generation as well. And the collective indigenous and immigrant population, what they were able to accomplish, I think um, words will never do justice to their sacrifice and their hard work. Um, and I believe that we owe it to them to also um, uh, move the flag forward, so to speak. Um, and so with with him, you know, there is a lot of inward inspiration, emotional aspiration and a motivation even in his loss to to establish my own legacy and a legacy that my own family could be proud of like we are of his. Um, I was privileged, like I mentioned in my introduction, to be uh, inspired and, and motivated by both my mother and father to study at the university in New York City, Columbia University. And there is where we kind of really saw, like Wahid saw in the backseat of the cab when Saad was sharing the story of the founding of Wahid. Um, for me, it was a moment, you know, when I saw the, the himma and the drive of people who were studying at that university. And it really motivated me to see how I, too, can use my, my intellect, my aptitude and the opportunity that I had and the privilege that I had, quite frankly, um, and, and to pay it forward. And so there is um, kind of like I said here, uh, the 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 possibility of himma and the impact that uh, a person's intellect can have on the world around them became very real. Um, I was fortunate uh, to go immediately after my experience in New York City in the hustle bustle of student life there as a graduate student to um, the city that you see in the bottom right there is a city that's beloved to me, Tarim in Hadramaut, and, and was able to sit in the company of uh, true students of ilm um, and I, what I believe to be scholars of knowledge as well. And that's just the environment there, I think, was um, it was a good departure from my life as a youth in Miami and then as a student in New York City to kind of literally be off the grid um, and to really see what, what I learned at Columbia University was kind of the possibilities of the mind and the intellect. And in Tareem, I kind of learned what the possibilities of the heart and the soul were. And um, I'm indebted to my, my experience and my time there. And I think coupled with my university education, um, it, it, they went hand in hand. And the last picture is just of my family. They were kind of the catalyst, the birth of my son, to do something with all of those things that I mentioned preceding uh, my family, my education, and my travel. So alhamdulillah um, for that. Uh, what what my son did inspire is what I'm going to be discussing on the next slide is basically in conversations with my wife, we, we thought about what the responsibility we had towards him was. And uh, I mentioned a few things here in the next slide and this uh, and this slide that I think are important for us to take note of, in, in my humble opinion, as a community um, and as a collective of young professionals and older professionals and, and philanthropists. So the first slide here, I mentioned that concept of choice architecture that like Muhi, you know, the the options available to us are not necessarily the only options available to us. We have to be both um, intellectually uh, forward thinking and spiritually confident in that we can create new opportunities and avenues for our community. And um, just as AMF has done with their work, Wahid has done with their work, we believe Sanad also is trying to, trying to do that in the field of education and community service. And so um, the education options that were available to our child were, were limited, public school, private school, 
Islamic school, we felt that there were some limiting factors to all of them. And so we decided to create a new a new model. Um, it, it's a webinar in and of itself to go into our model. But essentially what we what we did was we looked at what are the primary needs of a child, our child and what we believe um, most children. Um, and in particular, Muslim children, we, we felt that it was the preservation of their heart and their fitrah. And we said that any education must begin with that concern. It's one thing to say it, but it's one thing to actually build around that concern. I believe that we have many sincere institutions, many sincere Islamic schools, but uh, I believe that um, the models that we have in place um, don't necessarily conform to that intention and that principle. I think that we're trying to force that intention to a model that was pre-existing that concern. And so we decided to begin with that concern and build around that. And we do that through a variety of ways. Just to mention a few, um, small class sizes are very, very important. Um, intimate conversational style of learning we felt is very important. Looking at the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his interaction with youth, it was always very personable, very intimate, very one-on-one, -on -one, and unafraid to talk about very esoteric or spiritual principles, even with young people. And so we try to make that a, uh, a principle of our teaching style. And then uh, first and last uh, is our concern for adab and character and moral development. Those things we lead with that concern and we end with that concern. Um, at once we began to look more and more at the, the intellectual and emotional needs of the child, we realized that they were part and parcel of a family and a community. And that's where um, the, the kind of layers of the rose there represent the concerns that we began to have for the people that were connected to the child. And as a result, we started services for parents. We have a, a, a body and soul club, which is essentially a fitness club for the mothers and fathers uh, of the children that we serve. Uh, we have an initiative called the Guardians, which is um, meant to provide an intergenerational kind of opportunity for the grandparents of the children and just seniors at large in our community to remind them and remind ourselves that they remain viable and important to our community. And so we'll have them come in as tutors. We'll have our students organize picnics for them and show them basically the honor and the dignity and the concern that they are they are owed. Um, and then one of the last things that I'll speak to specifically about our, our approach, um, as, the, as the slide is titled, our goal is to basically establish more than one of these soul-centered neighborhood education centers. The uh, we are we are we are looking at the YMCA as a model, and we're thinking why can't our community have a Sanad neighborhood education center in every major city in North America? Why is that not possible? Um, and and we're unable to answer that question. We do feel the partnership with AMF and Wahid and others. Uh, in our community uh, make it a very realistic possibility and it's our, our mission and our vision um, to do that and so the quote at the bottom there is actually from Abraham Lincoln he said that die when I may uh, I want it to be said about me that I, I, I picked a weed and or planted a flower where I thought one would grow and this is kind of uh, what we're trying to do is that um, with the time that we have is to establish something good in, uh, in our community uh, but in the world as well and we're hoping that with the support of organizations like AMF and Wahid, we can certainly establish that here in South Florida, but um, inshallah duplicate it um, throughout the country as well. We feel the world will be a better place with the, with the neighborhood education center uh, on every corner of, of every community, inshallah. Um, we can go to the next slide, Mohi, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the enthusiasm and the optimism that we have in, in partnering with both American Muslim Front and Wahid. Um, we believe, uh, I believe as the director of the foundation that Muslim-led organizations must be held to a higher standard. I believe that um, uh, good intentions are not sufficient alone. Um, and I'm an advocate of introducing effective altruism to the Muslim community. It's a, it's a concept that has gained steam and ground in the, in, in the larger North American philanthropic community. But I feel like uh, Muslims should be leading the charge uh, we should have been the first to do the TED Talk on, on effective altruism. Um, and what it, what it means is that, um, that emotional motivation and um, uh, spiritual motivation alone at this point in our community's context and growth and evolution is not sufficient. We have to be wise, we have to be prudent, and we have to be intelligent on how we give. We can continue to give um, inspired by our faith, inspired by our spirit and our soul, but let's add to that a component of intellect, let's add to that a component of accountability, and let's add to it a component of 
of hikmah so that our giving is as impactful as possible. The numbers that he shared in the first um, part of this webinar were uh, honestly awe-inspiring, mind-blowing, and, and really showing how much we are leaving on the table. And I think that um, Sanad hopes to be one of these organizations that the community can have confidence in on every level, our ethical, our moral integrity, our fiscal responsibility, um, and, and that's what we hope to do. Two examples of that from our community and that what we hope you see um, as a possibility within Sanad are actually the Karawayin in Morocco, which was founded by Fatima al-Fihri. The first picture on, on the top right is actually a picture of that. And um, in my research, I actually speak a lot about Fatima al-Fihri, Allah be pleased with her, but we, we rarely mention or I have rarely heard about Maryam al-Fihri, her, her sister. And they were both bequest um, uh, money from their father after his passing. And Fatima built the Karawayin and Maryam built the Al-Andalus Masjid in Morocco, which was primarily to serve the, um, the refugee community of Muslims who were coming from Muslim Spain at that time into Morocco. But uh, Allah blessed them both because with their um, endowment, the world continues to learn at the Karawayin and the world continues to pray at the Masjid of Maryam Al-Fihri. And um, this is again to, to, to Saad's point, the impact of your giving and to Muhi's point can be generational. It doesn't have to be in your lifetime, but it could continue in perpetuity. Um, another great example of that is Uthman ibn Affan and the well that he's donated to the Muslims during the life during his lifetime, and that continues to benefit um, uh, pilgrims to 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 today. Not only does it uh, provide them water, but it provides them dates, and and more recently it provides them shelter. They built a hotel on that property as well. But again, you know, to follow in the footsteps of, of these great men and women, um, when the opportunity exists, it's one thing to be frustrated about those opportunities not existing and to uh, bemoan the fact that we're unable to. But the reality is that they do exist. You know, the work of Muhi, the work of Saad, and inshallah, the work of Sanad has an opportunity for all of us to be like Fatima, for all of us to be like Uthman. And when we do do that, um, the positive residual impacts of that are um, really unimaginable. We will, inshallah, see them in our lifetime, but we will, inshallah, see them in our children's lifetime, and inshallah, we'll see them in our akhira as well. And for us as Muslims, that's the most important thing, in my humble opinion. It's that we have an opportunity to leave a footprint here um, during our time, and we have an opportunity for that footprint to be as small or as large as it can be, and for it to be for it to make a noise during our lifetime or for, to, for it to serve almost as an echo chamber to, to last lifetimes. And so this is kind of the work that Senate Trust is involved in. We're primarily focused on education, on community service and dawa. We hope again to, to share our vision more with the community in North America of establishing these soul-centered neighborhood education centers um, in every large uh, community, inshallah. And we believe that with the help of um, AMF and Wahid and inshallah, people's generosity, we will be able to do that and do that with Ihsan, inshallah. Um, that's all that I have to share. I'm still here. Atika is here as well. She um, has uh, agreed and, uh, won and wanted to be kind of uh, available for the question and answer session, but it's out of her humility that she had me present. Um, she's the co-founder and uh, the founding, founding financial director and development coordinator for the foundation. So um, I would like her to share kind of um, what we see in this partnership as well. I kind of talk about it as a case study and what the Muslim community can do when they partner with networking organizations like AMF and Wahid. Um, but I'd, I'd love for her to share a few words on her perspective as well, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Rahan. Um, we are on a time crunch. We're actually on time. It's 7.44, so I'm just going to um, use the last minute before we open it up for Q&A um, to just reiterate uh, Brother Saad, Brother Muhi, and um, Rehan's sentiment um, with regards to everything that's been presented. Um, it's probably going to take a little bit of time. Even me, I was really, really actually, it was a very informative um, presentation by everybody. So um, I really want to acknowledge all three of our uh, panelists and speakers for sharing so much um, about their institute and the work. I personally have been involved with the work of Senators Foundation uh, with my husband for the last decade. And two things that really resonated with me in this entire presentation as I was watching the three speakers and thinking about my own work with Senators Foundation, I thought about 
uh, what we have done with the work of Sanad. And I thought about the, the, the reason why Rehan and I are inspired, and especially me as a mother, what keeps me going with the work of Sanad Trust Foundation is you see um, the needs um, of the nucleus of the family being met the, and the center being the child. And as Rehan spoke about it, uh, the nucleus of the family is made up of the child, the parent, and the grandparent. And I'm really passionate about that. And, and we, we are committed to basically preserving that nucleus. And as I heard... Um, basically, uh, Brother Saad, representative of Wahid, and uh, Brother Muhi um, talk about AMF. I saw the nucleus of the communal efforts as well. That basically brings things full circle for me. Um, so on an individual micro level, the work that uh, Senators Foundation is trying to do on a communal level, it's, it's really reassuring to know that there are other institutions that share the same aspiration and inspiration. And we can kind of reconnect and, and continue to uh, reconnect these nucleuses and come together, um, you know, share with the same common and aspiration. So um, uh, Brother Muhi mentioned how um, he's passionate about uh, building and developing relationships. And I want to reiterate the same uh, sentiment that for me also, this is about building and reiterating uh, um uh, developing relationships um, at an individual level as well as at a communal level. Um, and I, I really believe that if we can do that, we can help us advance our common aspirations and goals, which I believe that Sana Trust, AMF, as well as uh, Wahid Invest um, shares. Uh, we have a common aspiration to advance the mission of, uh, um, of our institutes that are unique in their own right. But I do believe that we have a common nucleus that we can advance the work of our community uh, communities together, inshallah. Brother Muhi, I'll pass it on to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Atika, Rehan, Saad, uh, for your wonderful comments. Uh, one thing that I'll mention, just to give a baseline um, of what an endowment is. Uh, you know, uh, endowment is when you put assets, whether it's cash, real estate, um, or appreciated assets, into a invested account. And then you further invest that in mutual funds, stocks, or real estate, and the appreciation or the unfortunate depreciation often at times will then year to year um, continue to grow. And, you know, if an organization simply starts with even $50,000 a year, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, you'll see the impact turn into millions, right? And that's the idea and the power of an endowment. Um, the, when you invest, if you get a return of, say, 10% or 5%, anywhere in between, you can use that return on investment. But if you're able to then further invest even the growth and put in more potential funds, you'll see that return multiplied. Uh, so that's the general idea behind an endowment. And many of these successful universities across the country, whether they are private institutions or public institutions, have billions of dollars in their endowments. I'm sure you can guess some of the top few, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. Um, they have over $25 billion. And even at a simple 10%, that's three, two and a half to $3 billion of revenating, uh, gen, uh, revenue generating uh, operational funds that they can then use. So that's the whole idea behind building endowments. Uh, and, you know, feel free to start asking your questions in the chat box. Uh, for those of you who are on the phone, I want to read some other things that we had put in there before we open up the Q&A. And uh, we talked about donating from IRAs, donating appreciated stock, uh, and it's estimated that in the next 30 years, $30 trillion of wealth will exchange hands from baby boomers to Gen Xers and millennials. And, you know, that's saying a lot. How is this money going to pass from one generation to the next? It's through estate planning. It's uh, hopefully when you set up your will, you are leaving a portion of that to charitable giving. Uh, and we actually have another webinar next week that will focus on estate planning, uh, tax avoidance, and charitable planning. So I will open it up, and I see that there's a lot of questions in the chat already. Uh, so I will 
uh, start with those. Uh, so the Inam asks, how sophisticated is our community when it comes to these different donation options, stocks, mutual funds, IRAs? I have not seen a lot of sophistication of a donor base or donor relationship structure to engage folks at these higher level donation options. The common donor just is one time donor and I don't feel many are sophisticated donors with those different donation methods. I would agree, uh, but what I am seeing is a lot of nonprofit organizations within the Muslim community are starting to specifically hire development managers, development coordinators, development directors to focus on this very issue. Uh, a small nonprofit may not have the staff capacity or the board capacity to open up a brokerage account that could easily accept these more complex gifts. Uh, and that's one simple thing that you can partner with American Muslim Fund on. If you don't have a brokerage account, you can set up a organizational endowment with American Muslim Fund or a donor advice fund with American Muslim Fund to accept these gifts. And then we can then pass it on to the nonprofit organization it's intended to. But all of that will require partnership. It'll require trust. And we're very big on providing these services to nonprofit organizations because I myself was working at these nonprofits for 10 years before opening up American Muslim Fund because I understood the challenges of nonprofit organizations. Um, so another follow-up question, uh, and if anybody else wants to chime in. Uh, feel yeah, uh, uh, Louis, I'd like to chime in very briefly to what so there's asked. And so the one thing I'll say is, don't think sophisticated. If you're investing, your money has grown, that's great. How are you going to benefit yourself and your community with it? Knowledge is power. That's the purpose why we're doing this webinar, is to provide education to people on those sorts. Mohi is absolutely right. Some nonprofits may not have the means to be able, able to have these people with specific backgrounds that can help work on these things, but that's what's changing now. And we personally at Wahid strongly believe, I personally strongly believe, in pushing the status quo on that as well uh, by providing these kinds of educational webinars and telling people, hey, you actually have those means available. You're just not aware of how to use it. So let us create the vehicles for you to be able to do that. Yeah, and I would just yeah. add, Mohi, um, uh, I, while you're answering Saad's question, I put uh, we have to start somewhere. And, and um, that's why I think to Saad's point right now, um, why, why we appreciate working with, with uh, Mohi and American Muslim Fund and, and Saad and, and even why I appreciate working with uh, Atika is that, you know, um, I think the synergy there is to Saad's point that we have to push the bar forward and we have to begin and and that's why I think that there's a, a great deal of mutual respect between um, these partner organizations so um, inshallah we'll begin we'll begin the trend brother Saad and, and inshallah we can hopefully inspire others to to give in a intelligent and diversified manner inshallah 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 and um, so the also asked uh, how do we get folks more sophisticated in their giving and and promote donor advice funds uh, many of you are on boards of nonprofit organizations. Um, tell your nonprofit staff members to learn more about American Muslim Fund and also encourage your fellow board members to open up donor advised funds. You know, right now I talked about how we have 55 families that we're working with, but imagine if, again, we were at 500 or 5,000 or 500,000 families participating in this collective philanthropy model. Uh, and donor advised funds, um, there are great ways to streamline your charitable giving. You know, you may have donated to 10, 15, 20 organizations throughout the year. And, you know, in the next few months, when you start preparing your taxes, you're going to have to go to all of those charities to request receipts. The beauty of a donor advised fund is simply if you give to the donor advised fund first, as a nonprofit organization, American Muslim Fund provides you your tax receipt up front. So you get that one tax receipt and it makes submitting your taxes so much easier. Um, another follow-up question from So, he's going to be our number one question, uh, is <laughs> Asker, uh, how do we engage the common donor to give in a sustained manner? Um, so, you know, I actually just went through a training that uh, talked about fundraising from the heart. Uh, and what they focus on is, you know, look at it from a lens of abundance versus a lens of scarcity. 
And what that means is as you are building that relationship with the donor and as you are going to invite them to participate in becoming a financial investor in your organization, you want them to perhaps commit for a three-year or a five-year timeline and really talk to them about making an impact. And every donor wants to make sure that their gift means something. They want to make sure that they're creating uh, and supporting an institution that is doing things by the book, whether it's ethically or having a great impact and uh, showcasing how those funds were used to benefit the community. So as you can build your organization's relationship with these donors, also talk to your top donors about this very thing of long-term sustainability so that it can be a conversation about how you engage those donors in a more meaningful way. So, so it is also asking, with an endowment, are you allowed to pull funds to cover operational costs on an annual basis? So yes, when you receive the return on investment, you can decide to put that back into the endowment or to pull from that. And you usually want to keep the principle of your endowment intact. Uh, that is a best practice and something that, you know, obviously, if you if you have a high need, you can dip into that principle. Uh, but uh, typically, you want to invest your principle so that it provides a, a larger return for you. Yeah. And I'll add to that, uh, that when it comes to setting up endowment, guys, that you are doing it for a purpose that supports a cause. So you're not relying on this money that, oh, it's going to take food off the table for me, but I'm actually investing this money for it to grow and benefit that charity or organization of my choosing. So the thought of wondering that, hey, can I take it out or not? Don't think of it as an easy investment that is easily available to you. Yes, it is, to Mui's point, but think about the reason why you're doing that. Um, and you can always diversify your investments as well. Have a donor advice fund set up that is supporting the cause. Have your own investments working for you. To Sister uh, Adika's point about the nucleus, I always actually, funny enough, use that example. Think core um, uh, strategy that is basically holding everything together for you, and then satellite where you have other investments that are working for you that you can dip into if you ever have to. But the purpose of a DAF is to support a charity for five years, 10 years, or however long you want, uh, so that it grows as low as you know your episode. Okay, great. Uh, so another question that Sod also has uh, is, is real estate and properties a good investment for endowment? Uh, you know, every investment is going to have some level of risk. Uh, so it really depends on market performance. And it's hard to predict that, but you can look at historical performance. Uh, and I would say that, you know, if you are in a position, if a nonprofit organization is in a position to um, purchase real estate, whether it's a home or a commercial building or a rental property, those are all things that, depending on the market, would be great to include in an endowment. Um, and in regards to um, the last question on the chat as well, um, would you advise an immediate hire for a nonprofit be a fund development director to interface with AMF or Wahid, etc.? And I would suggest that it's totally crucial for nonprofit organizations, you know, I, you know, have an executive director, have uh, program staff, but also put resources into fundraising. You will see a return on that. And the more a development staff member can build relationships and create strategy around your top donors, it will provide a return on on those relationships for your organization. You know, a lot of uh, nonprofit stats out there talk about donor attrition, donor retention. So you want to be making sure that you contact all of your donors who gave in 2018, who have not given in 2019 yet. And there should be a segmented strategy around engaging those donors. Um, so that's something that um, I often teach with Indiana University on developing annual sustainability. And we go into all of those metrics and all of those strategies in depth. Um, so there's so much that can be done on the nonprofit side. 
Yeah, and uh, to that, I'll, I'll add one thing very quickly, Mohit, to, to Saud's question, and you're asking very good, insightful questions. That's great. Think financial literacy. The one thing at Wahid we are really big on is educating people about money and how it's to be invested and how it can be used. And that's something I can see myself in the future doing with Mohi as well, hosting webinars, perhaps in-person workshops in the Bay Area to educate people about the important things of these sorts as well. And yes, it's very crucial for any charity of any size to be in touch with organizations uh, like like uh, American Muslim Fund, like Wahid Invest, to learn about our investments, how they could work in an, uh, an endowment, what are uh, what are the positives and the negatives of not doing so. The one thing I've experienced in, in over the years in my experience, and I've worked with nonprofit organizations as well, I'm a board member of MAPI's Muslim Urban Professionals, which is a nonprofit, is that we never really focus on certain goals of how we want our assets to grow. Money comes in through donations, is spent, boom, done on various things. But if you have a budgeted mindset and a mindset of investing that money, making sure your donors to what Mui said, knowing when they've donated and if they haven't for the following year, you're reaching up to them, having their strategy in place is important, but the, that strategy really works when you have the financial literacy education on your side as well. And that is what's going to change things, inshallah, in the future for sure. Uh, Mohi, Mohi, if I can add just to, or actually follow up a question of my own to Saad, you know, in terms of this financial literacy, um, you know, I, I have had friends and family ask me, and I, I think it's an important point to add into the webinar before we, you know, we push up against the end of it, is um, Saad, how, how does one give to the endowment? I know that there is the avenue of American Muslim Fund to, to, to work with them. Um, but are there options for them to give directly through investments that they already have established? Uh, do they have to establish those investment portfolios or accounts with Wahid? Um, these are some of the questions that friends and families have asked me. Um, if they if they did want to give to an endowment established by a nonprofit, um, what are what do they need to do? What are the steps that they need to take to in order to give? Um, and if maybe you can just speak to that. Absolutely. So, um, it's actually quite simple. They don't need to have an account with us. If they, if they do, that's great. But the purpose of donating appreciated stocks, so investments like the retirement accounts and so on that I mentioned is they've had it for a number of years. And now either they, they sell those stocks and pay a hefty capital gains or use it for a charitable cause. Quite honestly, when you guys have an investment account, whether it's through us, like through interactive brokers or say in the future, a donor advice fund through American Muslim Fund, they just need to have that account number handy give it to their brokerage firm that they're using and say, these are the shares I have that I wish to donate to a particular charity that, to Mui's point earlier, has a brokerage investment account. So they just do a transfer in kind where the assets are liquidated and the money basically comes to you. So uh, that is how it really works. If they want to invest fresh assets, then I would say most definitely using the American Muslim Fund approach, having a donor advice fund, putting money in at either lump sum or periodically for it to grow and then setting up, hey, I want 10% out of $100,000 every year to get donated to uh, perhaps Sunnah Trust, for example. So that's how they can do it. And if anyone has very specific questions on that, I'd be more than happy to jump on a call with them and explain further, depending on their situation as well. But more often than less, if someone has a brokerage account somewhere, they want to donate appreciated stocks from there, as long as you, which you do actually have an investment account, they just need to have that account number and details and they can handle it from their brokerage firm. Right. I, and I think I, I've shared uh, some of what you said as well. I'm glad I'm glad that you added a little bit more. Um, so on the side of the donor, uh, I imagine there's I, I'm envisioning three ways and you can correct me or Mohi, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, one way is to donate directly to the nonprofit. For example, um, there is no bait and switch. We're not going to be doing fundraising. But an example being Sunna Trust Foundation, we have an endowment account with Wahid. So donors can donate to us. And we actually have a policy in-house where we're actually trying to um, allocate a portion of every donation to our endowment so that it does grow. But we have a small endowment of 10000 with endowment with, with Wahid Invest. A person can donate directly to us. And we can have, like I said, our policy donate and a portion of that donation to Wahid. A person can have their own investments, like you said, with or without Wahid, um, and donate them kind of sideways into the endowment if they have the account number that we have with you. And or um, one of one of the even best ways is to go through, um, you know, if it's through American Muslim Fund, there's even another layer of accountability um, there that then through them, it can be redirected to our endowment account. Is that more or less correct that there's those two or three avenues that they can donate? Absolutely, from my end, I don't know if he wishes to add anything further to that. It could be, that could be of value. 
Definitely, I agree. Uh, and again, uh, in the chat group, I've even shared uh, the donation asset form. So you can take a look at that. And, you know, if you have appreciated assets, you can then mention, like Saad was saying, you want 10% to go to some of the trust or you want to set up a donor advised fund from those assets and distribute to all of the charities that you care about. Um, and we have a few other questions. So I want to get to those as well. Um, one is what are charitable lead trusts and are they an option for giving? How do they work and are they easy to set up? Um, so that question, I will answer what charitable lead trusts are, but I'll also say uh, we do have another webinar going deep on trusts and estate planning next week on the 17th. So definitely do check it out. Um, and the definition for a charitable lead trust is that it is irrevocable, uh, but it is designed to provide financial support to one or multiple charities for a period of time. And then say after 20 years, the remaining assets would eventually go to family members. So you can set it up in a way where, you know, let's say some families have a lot of assets, alhamdulillah, and, you know, if they're estate planning, it usually means that their estate, if their married couple is over $15 million, right? And if they have wealth in excess of that, they may put that into a trust. Um, and if you set up a charitable lead trust, uh, you know, you could then say, I want a million dollars in this trust and I'm going to name five or six organizations. So every year from the trust, it will split money to those organizations. And then after 20 years or once I pass away, then uh, the remainder of what is in that trust will come back to my family. Mm -hmm. So there are many different types of trusts and based on your family dynamics and talking to a financial planner uh, and an estate lawyer, uh, then you would be able to set those up. Um, but things like family foundations, I would say don't really make sense unless your family has more than like two to $5 million to put in. And same thing with the trust. It's in that usually high net worth individual uh, wealth category. Uh, but a donor advised fund is a fantastic option because you could also pair a donor advised fund with a trust or with a family foundation. Uh, and a donor revised fund is a fantastic solution to do the accomplish the same goals. Uh, but the the caveat is that with a donor advised fund, the funds in your account always need to go to a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So if that is your intent to have this wealth go to charities, you know, in Islam and estate planning, you can leave up to a third of your estate to charity. Um, so oftentimes when people are writing their will, they will do that and select the different charities. Uh, but again, you can simply leave it to your donor advice fund and then from there make the distributions and make it a whole lot easier. Um, so uh, another question that has come in is how long does it take to build an endowment that is mature enough to cover basic operational program costs for a nonprofit? Um, and Saad mentioned in the chat, it all depends on yeah. how much is donated in the first place and can be instant. Like if you find that one donor who has the capacity to, uh, you know, you know, let's say if your operational expenses are a hundred thousand dollars a year and, you know, you're looking at maybe, a 5% return, you'll need $2 million to generate that hundred thousand. Right. Um, so it's all dependent on fundraising strategy and, uh, we teach this in the Indiana University courses as well. If you have, let's say, that $2 million goal, your two, your top two donors should equal 10% of your goal. So if your goal is $2 million, you should find two people who can give $100,000 each to be your lead gift for your endowment campaign. Um, and, you know, there's strategy around how do you find those people? Right. You can do wealth screening on your database. You can find out more information about your top donors. If somebody is donating twenty five, fifty thousand dollars to you at once, Alhamdulillah, that probably means that they have the capacity to do more. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways in which you can strategize around building your endowments. And American Muslim Fund is happy to be a resource with you. And that's one of the benefits is by partnering your nonprofits endowment with AMF will help you come up with these strategies around fulfilling and building your endowment as well. 
Um, Millie, I believe I think yours and uh, Brother Rian's information has been shared as well. So I would definitely suggest for those who have not asked questions but are thinking about it and not sure, I think you guys can reach out to them individually as well to learn about the charity, to learn more about the American Muslim Fund. Millie is much very knowledgeable, been in this for over a decade and they're doing some amazing work. Same thing with Brother Rehan, if you want to learn more about the charity itself and what the foundation is doing, uh, I think you can directly reach out to them as well. Um, for sure. Um, happy to set up conversations and I've shared my calendar with people on the chat. Um, and I do see one last question um, that is in the chat, unless people on the phone also want to chime in, feel free. Um, so the last question I see in the chat is, well, no, more questions are coming in, is financial strategy would be to fundraise to get kickstarted, then in parallel fundraise money for the endowment. I think the challenge is sustaining operations doing this as well. For sure. You're going to have to have two separate strategies, one for the endowment, one for the operations. Uh, and, you know, I think it's fantastic that some of the trust has uh, this policy where the, each gift will, a portion of that will go to the endowment so that they can do both in tandem. Um, and it is possible to sustain both your operations and build an endowment. It's just going to take strategy. It's going to take time, focus, energy. It can't be uh, this afterthought. It has to be the present thought that you're building strategy. And, you know, a lot of people build their endowments over like a five-year timeline. And in that five-year timeline, that's the public phase. And even before that five-year timeline mm -hmm. starts, there's like a one to two-year strategy of deep diving into your donor base of who, who are you going to have be those lead gifts? So it's very important to put as much strategy and focus on your endowment as you would your operations as well. Brother Mohi, I had a question. Can I ask actually? Um, just yes, out of interest. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I, um, I, it's, it's something that's come up actually. Um, if, if somebody um, had non-cash assets, um, let's say gold, for example, I know we mentioned mm -hmm. stocks and other vehicles, but let's say a family has um, uh, some gold that they would like to um, donate through the um, donor uh, advice fund to AMF. Um, does, a does AMF have anything in place where they help the family um, liquidate that asset and turn it into cash and then put it in donor advice fund? If there was a family that was interested in donating a part of their gold um, to set up a donor advice fund is that possible can that work definitely um so we accept complex gifts of which would also be gold uh and you know the minimum to start a donor advised fund at american muslim fund is only two thousand five hundred dollars um so if you go up and down the street to chase fidelity schwab a lot of these places the minimum is often twenty five thousand fifty thousand a hundred thousand dollars so um you know with the ounce of gold being around, uh, you know, fifteen hundred dollars, um, you know, you could maybe even with a few ounces of gold set up your donor advice fund. Uh, so, you know, that is a very strategic way, especially within our community, uh, to kind of figure that out as well. Okay, great. That was a very good question as well, Sir Sadiqa. Thank you for asking that about, you know, special gifts and commodities. Um, I think it seems like so the now has asked all the good questions that a lot of people were thinking about, but he seems to have pretty speedy fingers, so he was able to type those questions out. And again, guys, the, the purpose of the webinar, again, was as we started from the beginning, is to impart this education, tell you all about what's available out there for you to support organizations like Sunder Trust Foundation using channels like American Muslim Fund with investments that Wide Invest has created that are ethical, resonates with our values as well to help those endowments grow over time, uh, whether it's through cash or through real estate in other ways and so on. But I will say again, American Muslim Fund has a lot of good content on their website. Look that up, reach out to them to ask questions. I'm available if you want to learn more about how investments work in an endowment or otherwise, more than happy to help. And again, our, our purpose is to support organizations like Summit Trust Foundation that are doing some really good work and how help them achieve their goal of making what they've created in Miami more of a household name on a national scale, inshallah. Yeah, I would just like to offer one thing uh, uh, from Sanad as well, Mohi, before we end the, the conversations that, you know, people have reached out off chat and by email as well asking 
um, about our work and what we can do for communities. We're happy to travel to communities as well to share our work and just kind of um, kind of share our story of institution building from the ground up, from dream to, to, to reality, and then hopefully um, beyond. So we're happy to travel to communities to talk about our work, to share how they can maybe do something similar or how we can work with them. Um, we've done parenting workshops and seminars and other things. So we're happy to travel, inshallah, to share our story. Uh, a lot of cities have, have, have wanted something like uh, an education center for their own community. So we're happy to travel, inshallah, if a community wants us to come out and speak about how they can do something similar. We're happy to offer that, inshallah. Uh, you probably will share our contact information along with Saad's as well after the webinar. But uh, anybody can reach us through our website as well or, or just rehan at senatrust.org. Likewise, I, I will echo those sentiments and, you know, American Muslim Fund has traveled across the country over the last few years doing presentations uh, and there's no reason why um, we can't do those in tandem and would love to visit your communities uh, as you continue to um, talk about these concepts and build them out as well. Sure. We'll be yeah, like a circus. We'll take our show on the road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we're, the, the, the trio is about to come out there. Yeah. Um, at Wide, we've done the same thing. I'm a firm believer in, before you even think about investing, educate yourself on it and the right way. So we're big on financial literacy, on doing educational workshops. I've done them all across the country. In fact, doing, we're doing also a webinar tomorrow evening that just talks about the journey of Wide Invest, what we've done so far, what our outlook for 2020 is, and our relationships with these two amazing organizations like American Muslim Fund and Senate Trust Foundation and others in the future. So we're all here to help in any way we can, our, com our, com our communities, to empower them and to empower other organizations as well, inshallah. Wonderful. Um, you know, if there are no more questions, um, you know, I believe we've shared our contact information in the chat. Uh, you signed up for the webinar. I will be sharing your information with uh, both Wahid and Vest and obviously some of the trust as well. Um, so again, um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our other panelists are offer similar sentiments. Uh, hopefully you found this very informative. Uh, and, you know, we'll just close. Uh, if uh, Rehan, Saad, Atika, if you want to say anything in closing as well. No, just I'm again, okay. thank our, you. our gratitude and thanks. And, and we ask that you keep us in your da'a. And if you can offer any support, whether it's nasiha, spiritual, or more, we're welcome to receive it. And, and just thank you for this opportunity. Yes, likewise. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a good night. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum